Chapter 13, Getting a Job This was a problem to me, because I believed in God, and I knew that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ I would be provided for. I had been sacked from Radio Rentals for stealing one of their customers' colour TV sets from the old people's home in Winslow. It was the colour TV set that Mick West had got. All I knew was how to fix televisions, and I was qualified for City and Girls 148 standard. I decided to take the first job offered to me at the Labour Exchange. This was with a firm called Electrolord in Aylesbury. I was being employed as a wireman, and on the interview the foreman called Dennis asked me why I had left my former job. I was determined to be honest, so I explained I had been dismissed for theft. At this he asked me no more questions, but I was given the job. I was able to negotiate for one day off a week without pay, so I could finish my college course. I soon acquired a good knowledge of the equipment which I was working on, and began to read the circuit diagrams. My knowledge was such that I was able to fault-find and develop test equipment. Electroloid were a company involved in making equipment for electroplating, and the particular equipment I was involved in was making was the controllers for the automatic dipping of parts, which required plating. A microprocessor would now normally be used in such a control unit. I was soon asked to go out on site and trace faults in installed equipment. After six months, I had been given a task of commissioning a control unit at South End. This involved doing whatever was necessary to get the new equipment operative. I spent a week away from home and successfully completed the task. I drew diagrams for the owners explaining how to fix things, if things went wrong. The owner of the firm was so pleased he invited me to apply for a job as their maintenance engineer. I declined the invitation, as I was not ready to leave home, as I had just found new Christian friends. On reflection, I perhaps should have gone after this job, as I now realise Christians are all around, not just in Aylesbury. I began to get bored and impatient when I wasn't troubleshooting, which led me to act foolishly. I began to experiment with charging lead-acid car batteries, and noticed how the gas was emitted from the battery when charged, at a high rate. During my tea break, I decided I wanted to collect this hydrogen gas in a very large plastic bag. The size of the bag would cover an overcoat or suit of clothes. I then charged the battery at the rate of 40 ampere hours, and soon the bag was filled with hydrogen gas. I thought what would happen if I ignited this gas, so I decided on a way to do it. I took two match heads, wrapped thin wire around them, and then connected wires to this and two long pieces of insulating wire. I hid behind the large metal cabinet and connected the wire to the car battery. This acted as a detonator. The bang was so loud the building shook and the whole factory stopped. The foreman came looking from their office out to see what had happened. I was so embarrassed. I came out from behind the cabinet like a scolded dog with my tail between my legs. The manager, Tom, asked what on earth had happened. Before he spoke, my conscience slew me. I felt a fool, and I dishonoured the Lord. I simply said the hydrogen from the car battery had ignited, but all was well. I told my work colleagues about it when they had returned from the break. I laughed about it then, but inwardly felt ashamed as I felt I had let Jesus down, because I had acted foolishly. Boredom, pride, self-seeking became a snare to me, and I soon began to joke and mess about at work, and I felt unclean. At that time, my brother was out of work, and Jock McCallion was replacing windows on a council estate in Rickmansworth, and he offered us work. So hastily, I handed in my notice, and my brother and I began to work together. This work soon, however, came to an end, but we soon find work in a building site as carpenters. We were paid £10 a day, which was good money then. This lasted for a few weeks. One day on the site, the men laughed at me when I told them about the Lord Jesus Christ. But my brother, for the first time ever, stuck up for me and told them that what I was saying was true. After this, we decided we would earn our money at welding and spraying cars. 
I had the equipment and knew how to do it. We hired a barn at Little Hallwood and set up in business. It was cold at that time of the year in January, and we heated the workshop with an oil-burning stove called a salamander. We were supposed to use heating oil or paraffin, but we used old engine oil to save money. This heater was called Sally, the oil-burning goose, because of the shape of its chimney. This was a dangerous heater, as I shall now relate, and I believe God delivered me from the catastrophe. One day I had in the workshop a Morgan sports car, which was in for respray. It was worth over a thousand pounds in 1972. I was working alone, preparing this car with the old Sally oil-burning goose merrily burning away, and it started to bubble and spit. This meant water was in the oil. Normally, when this happened, we would shut her down and relight her, but on this occasion she would not have it. She was so hot she erupted and oozed oil, gallons of oil, hot engine oil, over the floor. This went up in flames. The flames leapt up to the ceiling, burning the polythene ceiling, stretched across the rafters. The fumes and the smoke and the heat were so terrific. I cannot describe the event and terror I found myself in. What would I do? What could I do? All alone in the middle of the field in a wooden barn with a pool of leaping flames just about to burn down the barn and the Morgan car inside. My soul immediately motioned to seek directions and help from God. I'd done all I could. Now I prayed aloud and unto God for his intervention. I then left the barn with my back to it and my eye fell on an old damp tarpaulin big enough to unfold and use as a fire blanket. I picked it up and in I went using the open tarpaulin as a blanket and threw it over the burning pool of flames. The flames were put out and smoke filled the place. The flames reappeared a few times but I soon put them out. God had answered my prayer and the flames were put out. The barn was saved and our equipment. Here God gave me the wisdom and courage and initiative to apply a natural remedy to my dilemma. God had saved me yet again. Praise God. About fifteen minutes later, Mick West and his wife arrived, and the knights for a visit. They said, I looked as white as a sheet. No wonder, so I explained all that had happened. And that time, Mr Knight inquired about getting some insurance against such accidents, but the insurance company refused on the ground it was too risky. Shortly after this, I decided I would have to look for another kind of work. I found a job advertised in the national newspaper working as a fault finder at Pi TV factory at Fleet, Lowestoft. This was in the summer of 1972. I decided to take the job. I moved into the YMCA hostel, leaving my home in Aylesbury and parents' home. At the same time, Ken took on the job as well at the same factory, and we both, he and his wife, moved to Lowestoft for a short period, but they eventually decided to return. Elim Pentecostal Church I felt very lonely, but soon got involved in the Elim Pentecostal Church in the town, and visited the local Christian bookshop and ordered a book called The Sovereignty of God by Arthur Pink. It was soon made known amongst the young people that I was a Calvinist, because the mother of one of the girls had served me in the shop. I found this out one evening when I was standing amongst the young people on one occasion, and the girl, about twenty, she said, she thought I was a Calvinist, as I bought this book from the shop. She then asked me directly, saying, Was I a Calvinist? I said, Yes, I believed in the sovereignty of God. And she was the daughter of one of the senior members of the Elim Church. Her response was, Yuck! And she turned around and walked away. I certainly felt hostility then. I decided I would speak to the elders of the church about some of the things that I'd learned and read in this book about the sovereignty of God, about God choosing some and leaving others to themselves, and it wasn't received very well. The thought of particular redemption also was rejected. Now, after this, whilst at the YMCA, I became very lonely, and woke with a bad taste in my mouth. My mouth, in fact, tasted like the inside of a zookeeper's boot. This was a saying of Mick West. I decided to treat myself and ended up very ill. 
I began to take Andrew's liver salts, and at first this was very refreshing. It was so good I began to take it all the time, until one day at lunch I had stomach pains, and when I tried to eat a salad, pain increased intensely. This set off a reaction, which lasted months, and ended up with me being treated for a duty in ulcer. I remember speaking to one of the workers at Lowestoft Factory about Jesus Christ. I had told him all had sinned and come short of God's standard. He did not accept he was a sinner, as he had lived a good life and loved football. He asked me how going to a football match could possibly be wrong in the eyes of God, and I gave him a quick retort saying the scripture says, Go not with the crowd to do evil. I was thinking of the football hooliganisms, but at that time he said I was ridiculous. In the summer holiday I returned to Aylesbury and decided to apply for a job as a television service engineer in Tring. This was at Mr. C.J. Warden's son's shop. When I returned after the interview, it was said by Mr. Ward, the owner, the reason why I got the job was because I was on time exactly. I'd not planned it that way. Just arrived at that time. I started working on the 14th of August 1972 with a salary of £2,000 per year. I was very thankful to God for his mercy to me. I continued to work here and go to Luton College to obtain a further endorsement on my City and Guilds Certificate in Colour Television Servicing. Although none of the people working here had time for Christian things. In fact, I was considered as less than nothing. I was ridiculed when I said in the Bible God mentioned there was a synagogue of Satan. They also treated the apprentice as a servant, often humiliated him. I worked here for two years, but was not particularly happy there. My theological training, Dr. John Gill. We always closed for lunch, and it was during this time that I spent each day reading from Dr. John Gill's A Body of Doctrinal and Practical Divinity, which I found so helpful and encouraging to read. At that time, Michael had decided he wanted to live in Spain, and so he sold his house in Brackley and brought his bobcat catamaran. He lived in this boat in Dania, in Spain, and began to enjoy the delights of the Mediterranean Sea. Michael's difficulties did not stop, however, as it wasn't long before a hurricane hit the harbour in Denia, and his catamaran was dashed on the rocks, and one of the hulls was damaged. This happened, however, before the bad weather, and he invited Mum and Dad and me there for two weeks' holiday. One side of the ship sank after the hurricane cleared, and it was lifted out of the water with a crane in order to repair the boat. My parents arrived, and Michael found them accommodation on a friend's boat, and Michael collected me from Alicante Airport. I spent my first holiday from work, helping Michael repair the hull on his catamaran. On this trip, I took with me Martin Luther's book, The Bondage of the Will, a translation from German into English by Erasmus Middleton. When I returned to Aylesbury, the summer of 1972, and got my job with C.J. Warden's son, I attended an opening service of the Pentecostal Holiness Church, and a certain Reverend Gordon Hills was the preacher, and was the pastor of a church in High Wycombe, an Elim Pentecostal church. There was a series of meetings held for one week, and I soon realised he too was a Calvinist, as each night his theme on preaching was one of the five points of Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. I certainly felt encouraged, and assumed that Mr. Harrison, the minister of the Beaton Pentecostal Holiness Church, was in agreement with these truths. At last I felt here was a place where the truth and the baptism of the Spirit went hand in hand. I was so encouraged. I began to attend on a regular basis and got involved with the young people's work, and very soon we had far too many children from the streets to deal with. It was hopeless. I was hopeless at discipline and how to control them. There was a wonderful opportunity, but I found 
I was out of my depth and did not know how to cope. Not only that, but no one else knew how to cope either, so the youth work was closed. I was soon disappointed to find that Mr Harrison had no idea about Calvinism or Arminianism, and when I tentatively spoke to him about such issues, he dismissed the whole subject as little issues of doctrine. I began at that time to question many things and realise how easy it would be to be deceived if we were led by our feelings and not by the word of God. An example of this was shown to me when the pastor Harrison informed the church that the Lord had shown him the bungalow which he wanted him to have. This was at Windermere Close in Aylesbury. He said he knew it was the Lord's will because he had offered the people a cut price and it was immediately accepted. This was the means Mr Harrison knew was the Lord's will. The next thing the church was informed was that 17 clauses in the purchase deed which were unacceptable and therefore the Lord did not want Mr Harrison to buy the property. This was an example of what I mean. The Lord no more told Robert Harrison to buy the bungalow than he did to refrain from buying it. I did not feel or believe that that was being led by the Holy Ghost. Mr Eric Connett was another man who I respected and he attended the Pentecostal church at Beerton. One day, in conversation with him about the things of God and what I was reading and learning, he turned on me and said I was doctrinally wrong to say that the righteousness of Christ was imputed for us for justification. This was because each one of us had to have a righteousness of our own. Jesus had his own righteousness for himself, and we too need our own righteousness. I was shocked. On every occasion I could, I sought to reason with him from Scripture that what I spoke to him about was the truth of the Gospel, and I argued from the Scripture and said, Look, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. That as the sin and guilt of Adam, note, not the sin of Eve, that brought about the imputation of guilt of sin to the whole of humanity, so the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of Jesus, his life, death, brought about a righteousness that was imputed to all that believe. On this account only do we have a right standing with God. One Sunday morning he turned on me, in anger, and said all I did was talk about doctrine, but never about the Lord. So I felt wounded. I just did not know what to do, as I had always looked to this man for support and help, and I groaned in spirit, feeling so alone in this situation. I wondered, how should I handle this situation? I was now unsettled at the Pentecostal Church over a few issues that I did not know how to deal with. When explaining to the minister, Mr Harrison, that I wanted to leave because they did not teach the doctrines of grace, he said I ought not to leave because of a little bit of doctrine being different. I found the issue with Mr Eric Connett serious because he did not believe or teach that the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ was imputed to us for our justification. Although he had been helped to me, he was one of the teachers of the church. Mr Harrison said he believed in the total depravity of man, not that he used those terms. He said that there must have been a little bit of good, though ever so little in us, for God to love us and want to save us. I knew that God set his love upon us, and we had need of mercy, and there was no good thing in us to recommend us to God. I also found the issue of being led by feelings rather than the word of God very awkward. During this time, I continued working for Mr. C.J. Warden's son until I was made redundant during the period of the three-day week in 1974. This letter came to me on the 8th of February, 1974. I was home at the time of receiving this letter, and its date was significant to me. I realised I was now unemployed. When I looked at the date, I took courage, which helped fight the haunting fears of not being able to get a job again because of my past criminal record. The judge, Colonel Tetley, at the Aylesbury Magistrate Court had given me a conditional discharge lasting for three years. This was on the 9th of February, 1971. In other words, my three years was up. Three years to the day. Here's my redundancy letter. It is with deep distress due to this present-day economic position 
I greatly regret that we have to terminate your employment, as from today week. Rest assured that this has no adverse reflection on your work or your present unfortunate illness, and will be more than pleased to give you any reference which may be of help to you. Should the economic position improve, I would be pleased to consider an application from you should you wish to make at any time. I am always be pleased to see you and help you in any way possible. Yours sincerely, C.J. Ward. Please find and close your national insurance card. And here is the reference number. My reference. Mr. David Clark has been in our employ since August 1972 and has always proved himself to be industrious, courteous and efficient and a reliable worker whom we have been pleased to have on our staff. Since being with us, he has taken advantage of Day College to obtain a City and Guilds endorsement to add to his previous knowledge and certificates. We could thoroughly recommend him for any similar position and wish him well in such. We regret that the present government and the country unrest and the economic position led us with great regret to dispense with his services. C.J. Ward I felt so encouraged by this date and the letter as it was three years to the day since I was given the conditional discharge from my court case after the confession to 24 crimes. Remember, I was conditionally discharged on the 9th of February 1971. It was as though God the Father was saying to me, Don't worry, I will take care of you. I could now look for work, knowing and feeling I was free with a clean sheet to start again with an excellent reference.